Uh, the first presentation is Dr. Arthur Lee. Sure. Okay. Uh, and he's gonna be talking about access selection for blood and TBL disease, uh, how and why. Thanks, Arthur. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mehdi, for the invitation. Is there a clock? No, no I'm clock? your clock. Don't okay. <laughs> All right, so I have to apologize in advance. You know, the videos, they weren't able to get some of the videos to play, unfortunately. Um, but you'll see in this session, a tibiopetal axis, I think if you're doing CLI intervention, you have to be good at tibiopetal axis. It has to be a part of the armamentarium. I think it's gained momentum in the last 10 years and has uh, really been accepted as sort of a standard that needs to be done for most patients with CLI. It's also been shown to be very uh, safe with low complication rates when done uh, uh, correctly. Uh, there, you can do it with fluoroscopic guidance, which is what I did in the beginning, but in the last six, seven years, it's been ultrasound almost exclusively, and I think this ultrasound can help uh, make the process safer for both you and your patients. So selecting the access point is uh, some, somewhat you know, logic, uh, common sense. It's angiosome directed ideally. Uh, so if you have an ulcer on the bottom of the foot, you're going to go after the posterior tibia. You're going to go where the posterior tibia probably reconstitutes and get that access. On a practical level, sometimes it's an anatomy dictated. Uh, it depends on the site of occlusion, the quality of the access vessel. Um, you know, is it calcified? What's the size? Is it visualized okay under ultrasound? Is it tortuous? Uh, to make it feasible for access. So you kind of have to get what, you, what, you, what you're given. Uh, take what you're given. So for anterior tibial or peroneal access, uh, typically the foot ideal situation would be in this sort of position. Uh, and you'll see I have peroneal sort of in two different spots. Uh, I like to access the anterior tibial in this area if I can. Uh, if the occlusion site is right here, then we typically go in the dorsalis pedis. And again, if the, access, uh, if the occlusion is even more distal, we'll go down into the, the, uh, what we call a digital stick. It's really the dorsal metatarsal artery. Uh, you know, up here, if you can get it above the uh, anterior communicating artery, it's nice because as the, the sheath is in, a lot of times, even if it's not, um, you know, it's, the artery is big, there'll be spasm, you'll have occlusion, um, and you'll have flow through the anterior communicating artery, sort of perfusing the distal bed. PT peroneal artery access, again, ideally, if the patient can frog their leg out, this makes it a lot better for you. Uh, in terms of getting access, and I like to get it above the ankle, somewhere, somewhere within four finger breasts above the ankle, where it's a little straighter, uh, a little deeper, uh, and, I'll, and I do it because I like long access. Uh, peroneal access, I have it here too, because again, peroneal access you can get from an anterior approach and a posterior approach. Typically by <coughs> ultrasound, I go posterior. Uh, it's the same thing as a posterior tibial, but it's just sort of uh, twice as deep. Uh, if I'm using uh, fluoroscopic, if I can't see it with ultrasound, I'll go anterolateral and come from the anterior approach. So the benefits of ultrasound is that there's no radiation, no contrast. You avoid the veins. So again, here's a typical appearance, artery, vein, vein. Sometimes the veins ride right over the artery. A lot of times I've seen up to five veins around an artery, so it can have anomalous veins. Real-time visualization. So it doesn't matter if the patient moves when you stick them. You, you can still visualize, unlike uh, fluoroscopic roadmap. You can watch the wire traverse the vessel, lesion, and there's higher first, uh, you know, attempt access. Uh, you know, in the old days when I used fluoroscopic exclusively, you know, you'd be under the thing, radiating yourself, you get blood, you put the wire in, you put the sheath in, and you're in the vein. So again, to, act, to minimize complications, good visualization is key. Have patience when you start this, okay? Have patience to get the best image. If you're using a tech, and I recommend you use a tech in the beginning, uh, let them get the image, follow the tip down to the artery as opposed to sort of just guessing where you are. Um, so again, typically I use the smallest access. I keep it in the least amount of time. Now the least amount of time doesn't mean always get it out as soon as possible. I typically make sure that I cross the lesion, I deliver therapy, I balloon, and that's when I might get rid of the sheath. Uh, flush often, and I typically run my ACT over 250. Uh, we talked about over communicating arteries. Uh, if you have access from both directions, I like to image it after the sheath is removed. Uh, just to make sure that there's no hematoma or continued bleeding, and train your staff on hemostasis. So this is the unit we use in our lab. You can see the uh, hockey stick probe is really nice, smaller footprint, um, high frequency, so it, sh it images superficial structures very well. But if you do do something deeper, like groin access or, or perineal access, the um, multi-frequency uh, probe is better because it images better deep, uh, deeper tissues. So again, you want to set your image ideally. You don't want it too deep. You want it sort of optimized. You want the gain set appropriately. Thank you, three minutes. So again, this is a thin beam of sound, and you can see short axis versus long axis. 
In the short axis, it's very different because you want to focus your beam on the needle tip. So it's a little harder if you have two people doing it, the tech and you. But if you close the angle between the needle and the probe, you have a little better chance of seeing the needle come down on the vessel. Uh, you get a little directionality. You can uh, adjust it, and you can follow the needle tip a little bit better. I like longitudinal. If you have a tech, the tech basically focuses their beam on the, on the artery. That's all they do. Keep the artery in focus. You come in, and you adjust the needle medial and lateral until you see the tip advancing as you push. And if you follow that all the way down, you see the artery tent. You pop it in. You don't have to move the probe. Wire goes in. One tip is when you get down under the skin, start bouncing the needle, your eye sees a moving object better than a static object. I see a lot of beginners have a really good position, but they, they stop. They think that they didn't get blood, they, they're not in. These vessels are typically calcified. You need to push down on them a lot. Um, and so commit if you see a good approach. Also, once you pop through, because you are pushing it down so far, a lot of times you're on the posterior wall, the, the wire meets uh, uh, resistance. So sometimes I tap, tap, tap as I'm pulling the wire, uh, needle back and you'll see that release. On the right, that's actually a vein, so it's an exa exaggerated motion. A lot of times I don't give lidocaine. If it's a tough stick, once you give lidocaine, the image gets even worse. Uh, a lot of these patients are neuropathic, and they're still gonna feel a needle stick if they do, so I, I actually get access first, and then I lidocaine. <clears throat> Here's an example of a calcified vessel. You can see it moving around, so again, ultrasound offers the option of real-time imaging. Uh, dorsal metatarsal access, same thing. Ultrasound, you can see the vessel here, the two calcified tracks, the needle coming in. And that's what it looks like. So here's medial plantar access, dorsal metatarsal access. Here's what the lateral, medial plantar looks like on ultrasound. So this one didn't play, but sometimes you have to be careful. You know, manual compression is what I do for the most part. Um, but you want to take a picture and make sure there's no hematoma on the vessel or pseudoaneurysm by ultrasound. So this is, a, this is a case that's not going to play. But you can access occluded arteries. So in this case, we actually accessed an occluded anterior tibial artery. You can see the top and the bottom. If it's a nice visualization like this, you can enter it, flip, you know, prolapse your wire, push it through, and it's helpful in some cases. Okay, so let's go through the case. Sorry, they weren't able to get it to play. All right, real quick on uh, fluoroscopic guidance, because sometimes you don't have an ultrasound tech, sometimes you don't have the skill set. So uh, this is just for reference, but bottom line is camera position is very similar to where your ultrasound beam would be. Here's an example of anterior tibial access. Here's posterior tibial access. Here's peroneal access. So again, anterolateral, you put your camera about 20, 30 degrees ipsilateral. You come down, you separate the tibia and fibula, inject contrast, and you come down through the interosseous membrane into the peroneal artery. Here's a, a, a live example. So you want to keep your needle parallel. You inject contrast. You push it down into the vessel. If you don't see blood, you can move the camera orthogonal. And then in this view, you can see that you've gone past it, come back, and pass your wire. Another example of the same thing. And uh, if you do do it this way, they do have a needle extension holder that helps with uh, reducing radiation. So again, one more case that unfortunately did not play, but I think time-wise we're... So Art, thing. let me ask you a question, yeah. you, know, it, you know, for the sake of time, you know, you're showing these fantastic, you know, access points, you know, metatarsal, you know, digital, you know, ATP. How many of these, you know, so give us a brief in 30 seconds. Where do you, if you haven't done many of these, where should you start? And how many do you need to do to feel good about it? Yeah. Uh, you know, what's the learning curve? So I would say if you um, are just starting, um, I think it's important to get uh, you know, you know, adept at ultrasound. So use your ultrasound for every groin access, even just regular retrograde for, uh, femoral. Um, use it in critical limb ischemia patients because, again, you don't want to damage claudicants and, and stuff like that. Uh, you don't want to be you know, blamed for, for uh, sh um, borderline indications. Uh, but use it in patients that may have you know, at least two vessel runoff. Uh, maybe decent distal runoff, but have, you know, popliteal uh, SFA occlusions. I think those are the ones that are good to start off with because they're, you know, sort of wide open. Uh, and I would say, you know, 25 to 50, yeah. get, to get comfortable with it. Uh, and then as, it, you know, as the cases get more and more difficult, I think um, you progress there. I think, thank you so much. Yeah. No. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Art, if you don't mind, stick around because we're going to have some Q&A at the end. Uh, so the next uh, uh, presenter 
Uh, oh, yeah, I do? Okay, no problem. The next presenter, uh, Dr. Bacharach, uh, and he's going to be talking to us about crossing TBL lesions, wire based uh, approach step by step. Thanks, Mehdi. Uh, thanks very much for being here and uh, or for asking me to be here. These are my uh, uh, disclosures. So um, what I'm going to talk about, these are relatively basic, and I think some of these things will be in overlap, so you'll hear some of it, but it's really a crossing some tibial lesions and sort of a step-by-step. -step. So this is a more of a pragmatic approach. So you do have to understand a little bit about your lesion characteristics. The infrapropateal lesions are often long and diffuse, which are a little bit different. There's often significant calcification. Segmental occlusions are frequent. And often there's collateral frilling that's noted with the disease extending into the outflow vessels of the foot. So there are some technical limitations. Specific below-knee devices and peripheral specific stents or drug-eluting balloons are not yet routinely available. POBA remains uh, kind of the mainstay for most of you and for most of us who do this. And the development of combined antigrade and retrograde approach has approved initial success. And I'll touch briefly in a little bit more basic fashion on what uh, Dr. Lee uh, uh, very elegantly presented. So the approach, the targeted approach requires optimal pre-imaging. So you need good DSA. Um, you need to image the lower extremity and foot, typically in multiple views to demonstrate the best approach and how collaterals are filling, because often that's really critical to your success. So you need to ask yourself, is the targeted lesion a stenosis or is it a total occlusion? How calcified is it? What's the length of the lesion? And which vessel is the optimal target? Um, the, um, you heard about angiosomes, people have used that. Quite honestly, I'm, I've gotten to a point now pragmatically where I look at the vessel that I think is going to be the easiest to fix and that, that will provide the uh, best perfusion to the foot. So the angiosome concept is a nice one theoretically, but from a practical standpoint, um, go for what you think is the medius artery that you can open that will improve blood flow. Now, specific balloon types, you need to know a little bit about what your inventory has. Access your inventory. Long balloons, including tapered, can be very useful. Scoring type balloons may improve outcomes, particularly in heavily calcified lesions. Um, and so you just need to, um, and again, I'm not advocating any one specific type, but you need to know which balloons you have available. Now, wires, there's a confusing array of 014,000 wires that are available. You need to have a basic understanding of wire types, and it's really essential, along with understanding the type of uh, tip and the weight. Um, is the core taper short or is it long? Penetration is more comprehensive than just the tip stiffness, and you need to understand the concept of wire escalation. And I think certainly um, um, for those of you who are, are doing CTOs in the coronary bed, um, there's a lot of been done. If you can look, there's some very elegant uh, um, uh, YouTube videos that uh, Dr. Lombardi's done, for example. It gives you a big sense. And this is something that's relatively new to the peripheral world that we didn't spend a lot of time about. So with a tibial artery stenosis, well, how should you approach it? Start with a softer wire that's steerable and more forgiving. A long taper, um, it provides less support, but it often tracks better, especially through a long stenosis when you're not trying to uh, bridge a total occlusion. Avoid having a support catheter balloon too close. This tends to stiffen the tip. It increases the likelihood of a subintimal disruption, um, a dissection, or even a perforation of the vessel. Start with undersizing the balloon to avoid dissection. Um, Again, a wide variety of uh, wires are now available. Many are specifically designed for CTO. Be familiar with the types and find a few that are, you're comfortable with, make that you were workhorse wire. Be patient, go slowly, avoid dissecting the artery uh, or uh, uh, potentially uh, disrupting it. Alternative access, again, Dr. Lee did a very nice job. You know, clearly in the event that antegrade crossing is unsuccessful, consider pedal access with a retrograde approach. If it's subintimal channel requires re-entry, it's best to be as proximal as you possibly can be in the tibial, rather that improves the likelihood of a more durable result, and it also allows you to do a bailout if you need to put, a, a, for example, a, a drug-eluting um, stent, a coronary-type stent uh, in a more proximal vessel. That's clearly not something you're going to put in just above the ankle. Pedal access, which access, and I'm not going to belabor this, um, uh, dorsalis pedis is easier, PT. The perineal can be very difficult, and I would reserve that for really more advanced, uh, once you're more comfortable with your ultrasound and more comfortable with uh, pedal access. So again, just some examples, uh, pre and post. Uh, um, this, is, this was done antegrade. 
Um, just basically trying to reestablish, in this case, it really was a posterior tib was the only vessel that we could reestablish into the foot. Here's a short segment occlusion, uh, really of a tibial perineal trunk. You see the anterior tib, you see that short segment. This was actually, we used a coronary uh, drug uh, uh, eluding stent in this case to reestablish a posterior tib that allowed uh, complete inflow. Um, again, here you have just a really high grade stenosis with a single vessel runoff. This happens to be a perineal. Um, and again, we're able to wire this from a, uh, a, a anti-grade approach. Um, so this is a situation where we had, a, we came retrograde uh, or pre-retrograde, we came anti-grade. You can see long diffuse lesions in both the anterior tib and posterior tib with a little bit of filling of the perineal. This was one where we basically approached it anti-grade, used a long tapered wire, we're able to get through, and actually we balloon dilated both the posterior tib uh, and the anterior tip, basically reestablishing flow into the foot. Um, this was an initial attempt with a, a ret uh, uh, where we, you can see the short segment occlusion of a posterior tibial artery that we were trying to establish to get flow all the way into the foot. This is, patient happened to have a heel ulcer that wasn't healing. Um, you can see the other frame. You can see we're trying to come down from above. We can't get through. Uh, we're in a collateral, so it's... Um, um, so what we chose, we converted um, and came up actually from retrograde. You can see the wire coming up through a pedal access, and you see me steering the wire back into, the, into that small support catheter. And then we were able to wire that, and we now had a floss technique. We had a wire all the way through. We came now from above, ballooned it, and we were able to establish a posterior tibial. And you can see where we accessed it there. Um, that actually filled, um, and we had excellent pressure actually at the posterior tib when we, um, um, so there are some current stent limitations. The ideal platform has not completely been identified or developed. The use of existing coronary drug eluding platforms has only limited data. There is some data out there suggesting that they, they work. Um, it lacks the specific design features that would make it more suitable for infrapopoteal and tibial use. Um, unfortunately, there's been really no randomized controlled data to establish optimal utilization. Again, my, my only uh, advice is that if you're going to, if you have to do that, do it more proximally in the tibial. Don't try and put a stent down in around the ankle. In summary, uh, it's critical to have optimal imaging and identify the optimal target that you're after. Plan the approach and know your inventory. Be, be aware of the devices and wires that are best suited for your uh, intended target and don't be reluctant to uh, consider alternative access. And with that, I'll stop, and thank you very much for Please your stay attention. Please with us, Dr. Bacalac. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Roger is here. Kevin, Roger. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, the next presentation is uh, Crossing Devices for Tibial CD CTOs, Technical Tips, and uh, Dr. Rogers uh, is gonna tell us about that. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. How do I advance it? So I'm going to talk about uh, tibia perineal occlusions. And so first of all, why is revascularization of tibia perineal occlusions important? We usually uh, discuss this in the context of uh, critical limb ischemia, which portends a high rate of amputation and mortality. And it turns out, as I'll show you, most patients with critical limb ischemia have a tibia perineal occlusion. And even revascularizing a, a specific tibia perineal vessel in the angiosome of interest may have some clinical benefit. The Tamir's trial maybe provides the best natural history of uh, critical limb ischemia. It was a gene therapy trial in patients with CLI who were thought not to have a revascularization option. And it, it was a negative trial, but at 12 months, both groups, the gene therapy group and the placebo group, had amputation rates approaching 25%. Uh, 25%. And similarly, in the basal trial, which is a randomized trial of angioplasty versus bypass, at five years in this negative trial, uh, amputation-free mortality was around 50%. So, so bad outcomes in CLI patients. What's their anatomy? Um, this was a uh, retrospective uh, cohort study at two academic institutions. It looked at 450 patients who had critical limb ischemia and underwent angiography. 91% of these patients had a popliteal or tibia perineal occlusion. So patients with CLI almost always have 
a below knee occlusion. We um, increasingly, I believe, think about the angiosomes in the foot and the leg. Uh, if we want to perhaps revascularize an artery in the angiosome of a wound, if possible. This is a little bit different than perhaps 10, 20, 30 years ago when it was thought maybe just one below knee vessel uh, was enough. Um, are the outcomes really better with an angiosome-related um, concept? And this is a difficult thing to study. But at least in this retrospective observational study of over 700 patients, um, the patients who got angiosome-related revascularization did better than those who did not. So to summarize so far, uh, CLI is associated with poor outcomes. Tibia perineal occlusions are very prevalent in patients with critical limb ischemia, and perhaps revascular, uh, revascularizing specific tibia perineal uh, vessels have clinical benefit. So what? So just uh, you know, fix the arteries. Well, it, it can be challenging to revascularize below knee vessels. It often requires non-traditional access, if, as we've already seen. Uh, crossing these uh, occlusions can be difficult and it requires managing the subintimal space. Um, as mentioned, we don't really have dedicated below knee drug coated devices like uh, are available in the femoral popliteal segments, and hemostasis of these uh, non traditional access sites can be challenging. So, to focus on uh, the crossing step, which is usually the hardest step in revascularizing a below knee occlusion, um, why is it so hard to cross? Well, the occlusions are often very long. They're often very calcified, and even the best <coughs> operators are going to find that they're subintimal, and you have to be able to manage that subintimal space and reenter in the true lumen. And um, industry has responded with multiple devices um, to, this, uh, to this end. There's a handful of crossing devices. There's uh, BARD has a crosser system. It uses radio frequency energy to cross occlusions. A approval study, the Patriot study, involved 85 patients. 16% of these 85 patients actually had tibia perineal disease. The Avenger system is very exciting. I mean, it uses a rotating catheter, OCT guidance. It's been studied in Connect 1 and Connect 2, but has almost exclusively involved femoral popliteal disease, not below knee disease. The TruePath is a crossing device for Boston Scientific. It uses an 018 diamond coated wire that can rotate at 13,000 um, RPM. Its approval study also involved 85 patients, but only 13% had tibial occlusions. And finally, barred from the coronary um, circulation, Covidian has the Viance on tier platform, which is really a planned dissection reentry uh, technique with a manual rotating catheter that prepares the subintimal space for a flat balloon that can direct a wire to the um, true lumen of the vessel. We actually, um, eight years ago, published one of these, uh, the first um, reports of using this technology in revascularizing and uh, below knee vessel. Um, on the left, the two white arrows point to the fluoroscopic markers on the um, balloon that orients the wire towards the true lumen of the vessel. The limitations of, the cro of these crossing devices is that there's sparse data. It's mostly femoral popliteal occlusions, they're a little bit expensive, there's a learning curve, and there's reasonable alternatives. And they don't really replace just good techniques. And one technique that I find very helpful is super selective imaging is very useful in revascularizing below knee occlusions. Often the occlusion is much shorter than you think when you have a catheter as deep into the arterial bed as possible, both retrograde and integrade. This was a case I was struggling retrograde from the perineal to cross. I didn't know my wire was, it was getting in collaterals, but a super selective injection retrograde identified a patent infrapopliteal artery, uh, below knee popliteal artery, and uh, allowed us to cross successfully. Operators um, treating uh, below knee occlusions have to be good at the subintimal space. In my mind, I want to keep the subintimal space as small as possible for as long as possible. I want to keep the subintimal space as short as possible. And you have to be familiar with reentry devices and techniques to reenter the true lumen. There's a handful of reentry devices. Um, they have a variety of mechanisms. Um, none of them are necessarily dedicated for below knee um, circulation. Reentry devices have some theoretical advantages. Perhaps they save some uh, procedural time, perhaps they increase procedural success. 
But I think there could be some disadvantages also. They may be more disruptive for the subintimal space. They may, may be difficult to deliver to the reentry site, and they're expensive. There's also alternatives. You can use alternative access, as has been mentioned. There's a variety of wires and catheters that operators um, can be familiar with. And there's um, several techniques that help manage the subintimal space. Alternative access, um, there's multiple um, options. As we've discussed, it gives you more support. It may be actually easier to cross the occlusion retrograde than integrate. It may keep the subintimal space shorter. I would also suggest that we can use collaterals for retrograde access, and we can also use the plantar loop. So this was the case of the patient with a heel wound, and we actually came around the anterior tibial, dorsalis pedis, and the plantar arch retrograde to um, revascularize the plantar loop. Okay. Using a cart or safari to reconcile subintimal spaces, both integrate and retrograde uh, directions are important in treating tibioperineal occlusions. And finally, um, I'll, I'll finish up with uh, thinking about the future. I think classifying tibioperineal disease is uh, very important. We need more data. We need to be able to be on the same page. Um, TASC has expanded their classification and involved tibioperineal disease. Um, uh, Manesh Patel and Skylar Jones at Duke have come up with a runoff score that predicts outcomes. And maybe we need a endovascular specific uh, classification. So this is a very simple uh, classification, one, two, and three. Three involves the popliteal artery, one, and just involves a tibia perineal artery. It's not a flush occlusion. And I find this kind of classification useful in my practice. So if it's a type one occlusion, I feel like I can cross antegrade, treat antegrade. If it's type two occlusion, I have a lower threshold to go retrograde. It's a flush occlusion of, at the ostium of the tibia perineal artery. A type three occlusion involving the popliteal, I'm very quick to go retrograde, and then I'm gonna externalize and treat antegrade. Right. And of course, this is very simple. There's many other var variables that need to be considered if we're gonna develop a con uh, comprehensive algorithm. So I'll stop there. Thank you very Thanks. much. Kevin, thank you so much. You know, I, there, is, there is so much to cover, and I apologize, you know, and time is of essence, so I, I appreciate you fitting all of that in there. You know, it's really amazing. Yeah, so we talked about access and crossing, so let's get now into treating. So the first uh, discussion is uh, Dr. Ansari. He's going to talk about how to manage non-dilatable and heavily calcified lesions. Thanks a lot. So there's going to be a lot of overlap between mine and Dr. Shamus's talk. So Dr. Shamus is apologizing from the start. Thanks for this chance. Did you copy these slides? No, <laughs> that I won't do. <laughs> Wait a minute, I think this is not my talk. Press okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I have nothing to disclose. So yeah, the topic is how to manage non-dilatable and heavily calcified tibial vessels. And I'm going to start with a case, because in eight minutes I have to cover this topic, so I decided to make it interesting with the start. 67-year-old male that does not believe in doctors and medicine. That's my Western Texas population. Spends a significant portion of income on chelation therapy. Presents to our office with ulcer and claudication. History of cabbage and AAA therapy. Rest pain for five months and left lower extremity. Injured his toe and developed a worsening ulcer. And comes in and have been to multiple places before, he said, and nothing was done. I discussed this case in detail with Dr. Saab as well. So we started the consult in the office, going over everything with him. And if you could see, there is mild calcification there, if you can say. <laughs> Heavily calcified. You don't see other vessels. We don't, I don't know where it's going to end. If you look at it, we think that's where the vessel is going to be. A lot of calcification, and this calcification is really different. It completely takes over the vessel. We went to dissections, and we discussed a few cases with Reno Armani regarding lower extremity below the knee calcification, and that calcium and that intima and that vessel wall morphology is completely different than what we have in other regions of the body. It completely takes over the vessel. So we don't know where the vessel is. We are thinking this might be the place where the vessel would be. So doing angiography, okay, we see something over there. 
and we're trying to wire it, going with our catheter, okay, and with great difficulty the wire goes in. We try to go in with different balloons to see if we can dilate, couldn't get anything, so on, dilatable vessel. And we're now questioning where our wire is. We're not even sure if that's a vessel or if that's piercing the calcium, going through different kinds. Let's see if we can just use uh, the laser to make a hole in or see the proximal portion. We can do a little atherectomy and nothing. No other vessels, so type 4 CTO. Dr. Saab really likes to talk about that. So what's our solution then? We said let's decide to take advantage of pedal access. So these kinds of vessels, you have to be well-versed with CLI therapy. So Mehdi once presented a case um, uh, in one of the meetings where you talk about when you have cases like this, you have to access the different points because every kind of a vector will help you, and that's what happens. We went to the peroneal artery, we flossed and tunneled, and we decided, okay, this might help us. So we came from above, again, we used the balloon, nothing would go up, balloon not advancing in an anti-grade fashion, again, you cannot dilate, went with a thorectomy, wouldn't pass, then retrograde balloon angioplasty, and that gave us something, but again, there was still resistant in the vessel. So we start, this guy needs his leg. He's from Western Texas. What's our solution? So we said we repeated the orbital electorectomy. This time we came again after using a lot of medication that I want to talk about that. And two techniques that we used were one is sequential balloon angioplasty, then scoring balloon angioplasty. We prepped the vessel well, wouldn't stay open, and we went with stents because we have seen drug eluting stents. Um, have given results in a few of the trials that were done in Europe and North America. We have a meta-analysis coming out soon on that. So, and this is our results. So, pretty good result. We're very happy with that. Now, we do have excess point spasm because that's when we went to, but it's fine. So, a combination of various different things. We talked about excesses. The, I'm not going to go into details of that. But medication-wise, Dr. Charji is sitting here. We came across different combinations, and this is what one thing we came across. We call it a tex mix that we use in our very calcified vessels. It's a combination of verapamil, adenosine, nipride, and nitro, and we put it in a different, uh, it, it's not a trade secret, the paper will come out soon on one perfect combo of the dosing of these medications, but you have to keep in mind when you're using these medications uh, about the blood pressure of the patient, because these patients have multiple comorbidities, and some, sometimes to get pedal excess, you have to put them into a MAC, and you have to just be careful about uh, the blood pressure on these patients when you're using this therapy. So I like not to use it as a drip, more so I use it as uh, on-the-go uh, injections. The other tips uh, is the sequential balloon angioplasty. So these are vessels. I went in once in a very calcified uh, peroneal artery, and with a 2 balloon, a very small 2 balloon, I cracked it, and I end up having a perforation. And I went in to do the uh, tamponading that perforation, and it kept on increasing till the point that I literally in that vessel, perforated vessel, decided to use a very variant technique, go in with the CSI thorectomy, then tamponade it, wouldn't help, and I end up putting a stent in. Because it was the only option, because no matter how much you tamponade, whatever you do, that spicules of calcium wouldn't let it heal. And this was fairly recent. So sequential balloon angioplasty, you start with a really small balloon. You start with a 2O balloon, then go 2.5, then go 3O, then 3.5. Yes, you have to be very careful using a lot of these devices, but sequential balloon angioplasty in these very calcified vessels have helped. The other thing is scoring balloon. We use scoring balloon once. That's what we used to do. We came up with a technique. Scoring balloons, when you're using it inside, other than chocolate, where the other balloons have wires in it, it usually shaves just one side. So you bring the balloon out, you turn it, you bring it in, and you cannot move the balloon if you're turning it from outside, otherwise, unless you move it back and forth. And using that really helps. In different techniques, just putting it in, turning the balloon in different ways, it helps to give you some kind of a vessel form. Because this calcium that I saw in dissection completely takes over the vessel, so whatever you can get from the vessel, take it. I'm just going to briefly talk about some studies, LACI studies, 145 patients, 155 of them critical limbs, 423 lesions, 41% SFA, 15% popliteal, but 41% of those were infrapopliteal. 70% patients had combined occlusion and stenosis, 29 were the four, 71 of those were the for five and six, and the limb salvage 92 at six months. So this clearly shows you that this is important. Looking at the definitive study, if you look at the CLI patients, um, 
275, one third were then were still alive, and look at the 78% patency in these patients. So in short, calcified infraproprietal disease is more common, debulping arterial calcium is necessary, and there are many devices available, we're just gonna skim through that. Some have more data than the others, but there is still lack of comparative data, and it's defined, uh, de definitive between operators, how they prefer to use. There has to be a treatment strategy for patients in CLI, and that is a treatment strategy, but a lot of people come up with their experience in these fields. It is different calcium, it's a different vessel, different wall, vessel wall morphology, different intima, and that's the reason. Some, sometimes when you see these vessels, you can see on fluoroscopy if they're completely taken over with calcium, there's sometimes we do the modified Schmidt technique that Jam talks about, and you go into these vessels and you'll get some of your leeway with your wires and catheters, and then you just have to keep on working to get whatever lumen you can. So these are the devices, the commonly used one. I just mentioned the ones that I commonly use, directional etherectomy or TurboHawk, Hawk one for eccentric and so concert region, fibrotic or calcified, and you can use it till even the plantar vessels. Rotational etherectomy ones, uh, Jetstream, uh, Phoenix, Rotablader, and for thrombus, Jetstream is essential. SFA and tibial vessels, Jetstream, popliteal to tibial, you can use the Athromed, the Phoenix, but I didn't have much success with that, and rot Rotablator for the tibials. The orbital atherectomy, the CSI Diamondback, is very helpful for calcified to highly calcified lesion as compared to the moderate ones in these, and much success with those. And then the laser therapy and the cracking thing, which uh, I think uh, Dr. Shemes will talk about. So I'm not gonna go into details of this. So atherectomy, the calcium 360 trial, 50 patients, 25 randomized atherectomy uh, with CSI and PT, and 25 to PTA only. No significant difference in primary endpoint. Uh, 30 percent residual stenosis will all be lost but freedom from TLR 93.3 percent in those patients. So then we combined the study. We said, okay, let's see what is out there for all these lesions. And we also included above the knee and we included below the knee. Got some of my fellows together, sit into one room, got our statistician from the university, and we sit down, came up with this. So I'm going to end with this study that is going to be published soon. And primary out outcomes included TLR, amputation at 12 months. We used all the studies that I ever published, all the case series, everything which is out there. Secondary outcomes, vascular complications, bailout stenting, and all-cause death, and fixed effect we used for that. Our results were we got 9,874 patients. 3,000 in a thorectomy and 6,000 in the PT only group. Baseline correctors showed all these were old patients with 68 years old. That was the average age. Primary outcomes were target uh, TLR 16% versus 30%, and amputation rate at 12 months was 14 compared to 16 in the thorectomy group compared to the PDA. Secondary outcome analysis showed vascular complications 7 versus 9%. And bailout stenting was uh, 27 versus 10 percent. There was no all-cause mortality. So you see, the trend clearly shows uh, no, better towards, slightly better towards amputation. No difference in all-cause death. Slightly better towards bailout stenting. Vascular complication also trend shows slightly better in the arthrectomy group. And you see this over here: the advantage of TLR in these population. So ending note is outcomes calcification needs a thorectomy, safe and effective, and is feasible in the management of the disease. Each device type has specific strengths and weaknesses. One has to individualize a thorectomy device based on the morphology and anatomy, and it has to be case-based. What the future is, different combinations of drug that's in the working, different balloons, scoring and cracking balloons, using different kinds of drugs in combo with those scoring balloons, and devices which will be more easier, safer, and effective. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks. So our next speaker is Dr. Golzar, and uh, he's going to discuss uh, proper angioplasty uh, tips and tricks, which uh, I would take very seriously. Is he here? Huh. Okay. Uh, I, that's fine. We move to Dr. Mena, and I will find him. So uh, you know, the next uh, the next presentation is uh, pedal arch reconstruction. Why and how? Thanks, Carlos. For an Iranian to say that he's going to find you, that's a problem. <laughs> Can you bring up my slides, please? Good afternoon, Mary. Thanks for having me. Uh, over the next eight minutes, I'm going to walk you through what I think should be the reason why we should pursue this and how should we do it. If I can move into my presentation. All right, these are my disclosures. Define the problem, we're gonna concentrate pretty much in critical ischemia, which as you guys will know is rather for four, five, and six. Uh, these are the definitions of it, so we're talking about the same patient. Uh, 
typically we present a case, 63-year-old gentleman who presents with critical ischemia. The typical risk factors have been seen by podiatry uh, before as an outpatient. This is what we got in terms of non-invasive testing. Uh, you can see that the right leg is a problem, particularly below the ankle. So the question is, how do I take this patient from here uh, to a better place and what that place would be. Obviously, it's relevant because all patients with peripheral vascular disease, uh, the number is significant. These uh, statistics might have been shown before. The prevalence is quite high. In the U.S. alone, it's about 200 million people, uh, and um, it's a real problem. In terms of critical ischemia, we can see how 10% of those patients that have PAD will then go on and suffer from uh, critical ischemia, and those that have only claudication, about 5 to 10, will then uh, go into this type of patients. It's very expensive. So it's prevalent and it's expensive. And typically that would get our attention. When you look at the Medicare data, it's about $4 billion on a yearly basis. Contrast that with other, including heart failure and or stroke, and you see that the numbers are staggering. The first thing that I will bring your attention is the fact that over the last few years, there has been a massive explosion in both uh, endovascular therapy, both in the way of diagnostic and interventions, and this graphic from JAMA shows that. Having said that, the number of bypass remains flat, and despite of that, and or uh, better approach and techniques, as has been shown by other operators, the real problem is that we continue to see a, a tremendous variability in the amount of patients with critical ischemia, the patterns of vascularization across our country. Furthermore, as we go forward and we invest so much money and so much effort into doing or trying to figure out an algorithm to treat all these patients, CMS is catching up to it. And the real question here is value. And value, the best way I would think about it is outcome over cost. And anything that we do should be done or based on this approach. So that's the why, is because it's prevalent, because it's expensive, and because it's needed, and it's going to be looked upon and what is the best way to do it. Now, how do we do it? I think that I'm gonna make a few points and I'm gonna walk you through what I did to my patient. The first thing is that you need to know what you're doing, and that is basically anatomy, go back to your early years. We concentrated on doing SFAs, tibials, and often when it comes below the ankle, people sort of stop and there is a DP, maybe a, a PT, maybe a medial and a lateral uh, branch. But if you're gonna really become the person in CLI, you actually have to go deeper and try to understand uh, the different connections in the plantar arch and door the digital uh, arteries. And that is going to become particularly important as you endorse on complex interventions. You have been exposed uh, throughout this uh, course to the angiosome concept, and I think it's relevant particularly when you're talking about the plantar arch, and particularly when you're looking at a patient with a specific tissue loss. So I'm not gonna go through all the different branches, but suffice to say that there are multiple connections between the AT and the PT uh, when you look at this, and knowing which channel to use, which one is open, which one is not, which one is an anatomic variant or not, is important. Uh, the same thing when it goes to the PT. Notice how I always show you a lateral view and an AP view, because that's how you should be looking at these films. Not only one view, but both views. And uh, I'm highlighting here the relationship between all these different branches and the angiosome concept, which is, again, of paramount importance, and I show it again there. Peroneal is equally important, and even though it's not particularly relevant at times for the plantar arch, it does feed uh, significant collaterals that at some point may become relevant. So what's the basics of this? First, you gotta get good imaging. And good imaging relies upon you being able to do a good lateral view, and this is the lateral view that you must do in this patient's foot needs to be lateral, x-ray should be perpendicular to what you're trying to do. And again, we use uh, criteria for correction. This tends to be the basis of what we do, which is the base of the fifth metatarsal. When you highlight this, is that you're really doing a lateral view. If you don't show that adequately, is it not a real true lateral view? Uh, and this is the picture that you should be able to get. Obviously, this is a normal uh, foot, but in the disease foot is gonna highlight where and what you should be doing. The AP is equally important. The foot should be up. X-ray, uh, the way it's displayed in the uh, slide, and then the correction factor here is going to be the uh, first metatarsal space. You have to be able to lay it out, otherwise you're not looking at what you should be looking, and if you're not looking the right things, you're not gonna be able to open it up. And this is what you should be able to look at. And again, it becomes relevant in a second when I show you my case. Um, Obviously, you have to have a, a framework to start this, and that comes general aspects. You're gonna need to decide 
what are you going to use? The length of the wires, balloons, or what have you, the profile of them, the flexibility nature of them. There are different kind of wires. We've talked about this. Obviously, you got to become familiar with the specific group. There are millions of them. Uh, but you got to learn which one you trust, which ones you don't, and that's how you develop your armamentarium. Support catheter is pretty much the similar. You got to uh, group them in your mind based on flexibility profile and whether they are hydrophilic or not. I would highly encourage you to use coronary catheters that we use for CTO. The reason being the diameter, the flexibility, and the ability to cross through difficult spots. The wires, tons of them. You know them as well as I do. You gotta pick and choose depending on what the challenges are. In terms of angioplasty, whether you are contralateral or ipsilateral, I prefer ipsilateral for this type of cases and these are the considerations that you wanna do. And then techniques, there are multiple techniques, but when it comes to the plantar arch, intraluminal is the way to go. Anything short than that, don't do it because you're gonna make the situation worse. Is that what you're aiming for? This is a case that I did with a good friend of uh, Mary and I in Italy. Uh, and I'm gonna highlight quickly the anatomy, the SFA you'll see it above the knee, below the knee vessels, and this is what we did. You can see uh, that the SFA has a significant disease, more or less here. Obviously, that's not the reason why the patient presented like this. This is the pop. You see here the AT, the peroneal is there, and the PT is missing, or target like in the case that I presented was the PT. Good lateral, you see highlighted the base of the filament of tarsal, and a good AP, you see the space. Clearly, I need to open the PT and the plantar arch. Without that, I'm not gonna be able to offer this patient what I need. So here we go, we go with a support catheter and a wire, and in typical uh, peripheral practice, we push, we push until we hopefully get somewhere. We push here, but unfortunately, we didn't get where we wanted to go. Uh, Mary has an Iranian expression for this. You're trying type of to make situations. us all look bad, man. This is not fair. You know, it's like, you know, and my then, people are here that, like, it takes I you push. three hours to do this, and this guy did it in 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so now, here is the, the money shot. I had shown you how AP and lateral are very important. Here I'm using the AP, and I'm using the, the metatarsal space as a point of reference. I'm going to access this. This is a stream access. It's important, but it helps you and it highlights the importance of good imaging and good concepts. I go here, we access, we go uh, and start looking and navigating the plantar arch, and you can see how important it is. Then we go here retrograde, and you can see how we are able to open the PT in a nice fashion. What I do afterwards is just as I exteriorize the wire, I change my approach to the uh, anterior approach. I don't like to do anything from the retrograde approach in this location. I think it's problematic. I confirm my position. I didn't like the guy wire that was here, and I wanted to achieve hemostasis. I put another guy wire, balloon and angioplasty, as we will always do in this location. There's no specific devices other than that for the below the arch. And you can see great result in the PT and a beautiful plantar arch, done in a retrograde fashion, understanding the anatomy, where to puncture and how to puncture. Is this relevant? I think so, because this is the next frontier. Stopping at the ankle is no longer an option. Mary, thank you for yeah, the invitation. Thank you very much. Can you stay, Carlos? I'm going to discuss it. Sure. That was fantastic. Thank you. And I love how you do the video like that. I wish I could do it live and get done quick. You know, our uh, next speaker to be found, Dr. Golzar. Thanks for coming, man. <laughs> He's going to talk about proper angioplasty, tips and tricks. Sorry about that. Someone offered me a joint outside, and then I just <laughs> lost track of time. So I don't even know what time it is right now. So um, how do we? All right, so I'm going to be talking about angioplasty. So we've talked about, uh, Carlos showed some great cases on below the knee intervention, below the ankle intervention, and essentially it's all going to be pretty much angioplasty when you get especially that far down. So my task was to talk about the technical tips on angioplasty and sizing. These are my disclosures. So when we talk about uh, PVI imaging, there's several challenges, and this is what gets into the challenges of sizing. You have poor image quality, especially if you're not doing DSA. You have, to, sorry, these lines are not supposed to be there. I think there's something, a problem with the transformation from uh, Mac to PowerPoint. There's tapering of vessels, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit. It happens when you're going from the SFA to the popliteal, as well as from the proximal infrapopliteal vessel to the uh, distal infrapopliteal vessels. 
Um, and then also, you, a lot of physicians undersize, and we talked about this this morning, Mehdi and I did at one of the sessions, is they undersize their angioplasty balloon because of a fear of perforation and dissection. And that's probably the wrong thing to do. Now, in terms of optimal vessel sizing for angioplasty, we don't have a lot of data. So we have to be intuitive about it. So it seems to make sense, right? So it seems intuitive that if you have a correct vessel size and you're using angioplasty, that should be the right way to do it. There's really no studies that have looked at appropriate sizing for angioplasty in peripheral vascular intervention. Most of the data that we use is extrapolated from coronary data. And it's logical that if optimal sizing improves your coronary intervention, coronary artery intervention, that it's going to improve your peripheral vascular intervention as well. Now, we do know in coronary arteries it makes a difference. We know that in coronary interventions, optimal sizing, especially with intravascular ultrasound, is important, and uh, vessel sizing uh, is important. And it's even more important with stenting, where we know in coronary stenting you have much better outcomes if you have the proper size uh, a stent implantation, and you have much worse outcome if you undersize your stent or oversize this, uh, the stent. Now, if we take that to the next step and talk about how does this translate over to the vascular world, what are the consequences of um, uh, uh, suboptimal uh, angioplasty? If you undersize, again, inadequate vessel prep, and especially in the world of drug elution, be it uh, microinfusion uh, therapeutics or with drug-coated balloons, proper angioplasty and proper vessel prep is essential. You undersize, you get vessel recoil. You can't deliver a stent. You, don't, uh, you try to deliver that stent, and now it doesn't expand correctly. Now, on the opposite side, over, uh, oversizing, what does that cause? A acute vessel closure due to dissection and perforation. So those are the consequences of not getting it right. So what are your options? So what can we do? So we have usually what most of us do is angiography. So when you look at an SFA or an anterior tibia uh, uh, a bit below the knee in, uh, vessel, you guesstimate what size it is, and you're, you kind of have in your mind what range that should be, but that comes with experience. That comes with doing hundreds and thousands of cases. And that's when you sort of, you can look at it, you get a gestalt of, okay, this is the size. Now, what are those sizes? So I'm just going to go through these. So in order to get these sizes, I have in my mind what most of these sizes and averages are going to be. Um, there is some data out there that looked at ultrasound, but the problem is, is when they look at ultrasound, they look at external vessels instead of the uh, internal lumen size. There's not a lot of IVIS data. There's some data with CT, but not a lot. So some of what I'm giving you is what I use in my mind and when I teach fellows uh, 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 for uh, you know, vessel sizing. This is sort of some of the estimates I, I use as we go through this. Some of it does have some data, but there's such a big range that it really doesn't fit. So this is what I use. Hopefully, you'll be able to benefit. The biggest difference I see is between males and females, and I always change my sizing based on that. So in a male, the common iliac artery, usually between 9 to 10 millimeters, external iliac artery, 8 to 9 millimeters. Females, usually 1 millimeter less. The common iliac is 8 to 9, external is 7 to 8. When we get into the femoral artery, and, uh, and, may, uh, and this is uh, what I was talking about, the range, these are those, those studies, and again, you'll see common femoral 3.9 to 9.0. Have you ever seen a 3.9 millimeter common femoral? Never have. So, I mean, the studies are just out there, so I wanted to prevent it, but this is what I use. In a common femoral in a male, 7 to 8 millimeters, profunda 3 to 6, superficial femoral artery in a male, between 5 to 7 millimeters. In a female, again, about a millimeter less. So common femoral artery would be about 6 to 7 uh, millimeters, profunda 3 to 5, and superficial femoral 4.5 to 6. As we go down into the popliteal artery, this is where you start, it gets a little tricky. So the popliteal artery has three segments, the P1, P2, and P3 segments, and that's a completely different talk, but the different characteristics of each of these segments of the popliteal artery. Now, the popliteal artery stays pretty consistent until the P3 segment past the knee joint, and that's where it becomes, it really tapers down. 
So in men, you see usually the, the uh, proximal and mid popliteal arteries are between five to six millimeters, and distal pop four to five millimeters, and females slightly smaller, 4.5 to six, and then down into distal, 3.5 to 4.5. I think that probably below the knee is, is the most challenging part, is because, you know, this is where I see a, a tendency to undersize. And usually, if you're going to use with angioplasty alone results, you really don't want to leave with a suboptimal angioplasty result. So this is really where I see the biggest undersizing taking place. So in males, we usually think about uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, vessels will taper. Proximal is going to be different than the distal vessel. So proximal, you see between three to four millimeters. And this is regardless of which vessel we're talking about. And distally, 2.5 to 3.0. So this is much less than what I usually see, which is 2.0 in a male. They'll you know, balloon a distal uh, or even a proximal uh, anterior tibia already with a 2.0. That's too small. In a female, again, about 3.0 to 3.5 proximally and 2.0 to 2.5. Now, what I really like about the infrapopliteal vessels are the uh, the tapered balloons, the Nanocross, Medtronic makes that. So that's a really nice balloon because it has that taper to it. It'll go from like 2.5 to 3.0, 3.0 to 3.5 because of that infrapopliteal taper that you see. And then getting into the pedal arteries in men, um, I use a 2.0 to 2.5 below the ankle. Uh, and then once I get uh, really far distal, I use 1.5. And as you can see in the female, slightly less. So that's angiography. You can use CT, you can use OCT, you can use intravascular ultrasound. These are all tools that you can use. The question is, is when do you use it? Do you use it at every single patient? Probably not. I don't because it takes me time, resources. So when do I use it? I know this is not a stent talk, this is an angioplasty talk, but that's really the main time that I would use it. So I'd use it definitely if I'm using a covered stent because we know that outcomes are improved with covered stent implantation, especially in a popliteal artery or in an iliac artery. So really I wanna get a perfect size there. For a supera stent, same thing. We want to make sure that the vessel prep is adequate and that we're sizing that vessel uh, appropriately. And we know that that affects long-term patency. So appropriately sizing and prepping that vessel is really important. And those patients that have chronic kidney disease, limited dye use, uh, IVIS is helpful. A few pearls in terms of angioplasty. I always say slow and low. This helps prevent le vessel trauma. So I, I don't even look at the compliance chart. I don't look at the sizing. I just go up slowly. It takes me about 30 seconds to go up, slowly and still I see, until I see conforming of the balloon to the vessel wall. And this is usually two to three atmospheres. I never take it to even the nominal pressure, and that's okay. Long balloon inflations, usually two minutes is a must. And any sign of ves a pain, is vessel stretch. So when you're, especially you'll see that in the SFA, you'll, you know, you'll crank that vessel, let's say you're putting in a DCB, and they'll, they'll kind of feel that, the patient will feel that, that's okay, that means that you're just stretching out that vessel. If you're not doing it too fast, if you're not going up too quickly, and you're taking your time, that's okay to stretch the vessel a little bit. I'm more likely to oversize than undersize, but again, if you do it slowly, you go up slow, you stay up for two minutes, that's okay, don't be too scared about that. So in conclusion, angioplasty can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Sizing, tech, sizing and technique is important. Know the general size of vessels and use your additional imaging tools when necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to invite my co-moderator, who I think most of you know, Sama Ida, who has really contributed significantly to the field of CLI. Um, and uh, use the escape, please escape. This one? Okay. And has uh, really contributed and uh, his leadership in Japan and uh, really, you know, we enjoyed learning from them. He's gonna talk about innovation in CLI. So what is the next frontier and how can we be more creative? Okay. Thank you, Mehdi. So I have nothing to disclose. Uh, here is a step-by-step -step approach in goal of CLI treatment. Uh, because a patient with CLI exposed to severe ischemia, revascularization is optimal treatment, and the short to intermediate treatment goal is to relieve the ischemic pain. 
cure ischemic wound and avoid major amputation. After overcoming a CLI condition, long-term treatment goal is to improve the patient QOL, ADL, and the mortality. Absolute goal for CLI patient is to improve the patient mortality with well-being. Uh, these are many innovations of CLI treatment within the current decade. These innovations dramatically contribute to CLI outcome improvement. In other words, people who engage the CLI treatment should understand these. Uh, here are two major studies comparing the endovascular therapy versus surgical bypass therapy in CLI patient. Basic trial was a consist of the prospect multicenter randomized trial, while the critical study was a prospect prospective multicenter registry. According to these two studies, if amputation free survival is an end point, result of endovascular therapy is compared to that of the surgical bypass therapy. Uh, in terms of the evaluation of ischemia, Skin perfusion pressure, pressure plays an important role for assessing the severity of ischemia and the predicting wound healing. If skin perfusion pressure is over 4 mm, 40 mm mercury, 100% wound healing rate expected, and this modality has been mentioned in the ACC guideline. Uh, regarding the assessment of wound severity, Wi-Fi classification is an alternative grading Currently, ESC and ESVS 2017 guideline recommended that management of the patient with CLI should consider the three components of this Wi-Fi classification system. Revascularization should always uh, be discussed as its suitability is increased with more severe stages. Uh, it is not too much to say that clinical outcome of CLI treated endovascular thanks to the innovation of the technique, especially in the below the knee artery region. These are many techniques as a CT revascularization strategy, and there is a general agreement for acquiring the better outcome. I think these techniques should be routinely mastered in the physician who perform the endovascular intervention. Uh, Angiosome concept and wound brush are clinically important to define the end point of CLI intervention. Before emerging the, these concepts, it is hard to clearly decide whether the procedure could finish or not. After widespread applying this strategy, we can decide the procedure end point with strong confidence. What is the true treatment strategy below the knee region? Because the diffuse calcifying and totally occlusive disease are commonly found, and the stent based treatment is the ideal, but the full metal jacket using the stent is not realistic. DCB based treatment is a clinical idea, but have no general consensus in this field. Further in the investigation should be warranted. After revascularization for vessel, Quality of wound care directly and critically impact the patient's prognosis. Recently, negative pressure wound therapy plays an important role for wound care and is essential therapy for especially severe wound. Uh, ultimate clinical question is real-world practice with whether the revascularization would improve the CDL mortality. We therefore conducted the priority registry. Uh, this priority registry is the first prospective medical center real world study assessing the pro prognostic impact of revascularization for poor risk CLI patient. Uh, here is the one year survival rate of the two groups, revealing the major, uh, main result in this study. At uh, three months, the survival rate was 83% in the revascularization group and 76% in the non revascularization group. Uh, there, these are significant intergroup differences. However, at one year, survival rate was 55% versus 51% with no significant difference. One year overall survival rate was not significantly different between the revascularization and the non revascularization group in poor risk CLI patients. To explore for subgroup in favor of revascularization, we subsequently performed the risk stratification analysis. The screening analysis suggests that the subgroup with non-older age, non-heart failure, and non-rest of pain CLI were in favor of revascularization. 
Uh, we also compared the clinical outcome between the surgical reconstruction and endovascular therapy for Japanese patients with CLI in today's real world setting. After propensity matching analysis, the three year amputation free survival rate was not different between the groups. Amputation free survival at three year in both groups was 52%. This result was similar to previous Basil and Critis study. So we also performed the interaction analysis providing the five factors more favorable for surgical reconstruction and another five factors less favorable for surgical reconstruction. If the total point of the patient is plus one or more, these patients are suitable for surgical reconstruction. On the other hand, if the total point is minus two or less, these patients are suitable for endovascular therapy. The subsequent interaction analysis suggests that CLI with severe wound status might be more fit for surgical reconstruction, while the, those with a poor general condition might benefit more from the endovascular therapy in terms of amputation-free survival. Uh, in this presentation, I summarize current innovation of CLI treatment. Further innovation will be needed to improve the CLI outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, our next presenter is uh, my good friend, Dr. Nicholas Shamas, who is going to talk about do we really need a therectomy for TBL disease? So, Thanks. Mandy, we have restarted the program here. No, 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 just, <laughs> just close the. Should we start X. from the beginning? <laughs> no, please don't. Yes. So because I don't do mind, that. but I think the people here probably will get upset. Yes, I can imagine. They want to go and join Dr. Golzar outside. Some of them, not everybody, maybe. I don't know. All right, perfect. <laughs> uh, let's see. Which one is to move forward? You have to wait. Uh -huh. Got it. All right. Well, Mehdi, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and thank you for an amazing meeting. It just really gets better every single year, which is amazing. So, uh, Mehdi asked me to speak about do we really need atherectomy for tibial disease? Quite a simple question, right? You know, when you think about uh, the potential answers for that question, you know, we probably will need a whole day to discuss this, but I got eight minutes to cover it. So let's start with the basics here. What are the, our options to treat tibial disease? Angioplasty, stents, drug-coated balloon, atherectomy. Now we have shockwave, specialty balloon, bypass surgery, and of course the deep venous arterialization for no option disease. A lot of options available to us right now. Here's a uh, simple meta-analysis that Dr. Mustafa has done, taken 52 studies, over 6,000 patients, showing that angioplasty uh, carries very poor outcome overall, with the primary patency at one year is only 63%, and repeat revascularization, 18%, still major amputation and all-cause mortality is about 15%, so really not very good, despite good technical success that was uh, reported to be about 91.1%. So very suboptimal results when we look at PTA. Data came in to try to support uh, uh, pretty much bare metal stent versus angioplasty for infrapopliteal disease. We've seen that with the carbofilm coated BMS trial in 2006, showing better data for patency. However, when you put this trial along with three other trials and look at patency in a meta-analysis, it really showed absolutely no advantage of, plain, uh, of bare metal stenting uh, over plain old balloon angioplasty. When you start looking at uh, drug-coated balloon versus PTA, are we making any really progress here? And you can see from the uh, debate uh, uh, BTK trial, there was some uh, signals that we have better restenosis and uh, TLR rate, uh, which is uh, on the low end. However, when you start looking at the impact deep, which was a lot more vigorously done, there is a more uh, a core lab analysis to the data, and you can see it's not only that restenosis was not affected, uh, neither TLR, but also late lumen loss was not different at all. And in fact, if you look at the two randomized trials with uh, core lab adjudication, and these are the only two randomized trials uh, comparing DCB versus BTA with core lab adjudication, you can see that late lumen loss have not been different at all between DCB and BTA, and you can see the binary restenosis is not different either. It's interesting, you know, that we can come up with a conclusion that maybe there is no biological effect for DCB below the knee, at least without vessel prepping or preparing this type of disease. 
Now you say, what about drug-eluting stent? Well, drug-eluting stents, you know, when you see the three major trials, the Yukon, Destiny, and Achilles, and you can, you can clearly see that there's an improved in patency rate uh, when you compare, you know, the uh, coronary drug-eluting stent to bare metal stent uh, or PTA or combination. Uh, and when you put this in a meta-analysis that included those three trials plus two other studies, you can see an advantage to TLR, an advantage when it comes to restenosis, an advantage when it comes to reducing amputation and no change in death. So we got some signal that th this kind of therapy, at least coronary for proximal tibial disease, seems to be beneficial. When you compare that with drug-coated balloons, so DES versus drug-coated balloon, we have two really significant trials, the IDEAS trial, that showed an improvement in binary angiographic restenosis rate uh, was better you know, with DES compared to uh, drug-coated balloon. And when you look at the DESTINY trial for DES versus BMS, showed the exact same thing. And uh, again, that correlated with a significant improvement in the late lumen loss with DES compared to BMS, which actually support the clinical data. Having said that, DES have a lot of problems with them when it comes to infrapopliteal disease. First of all, they have been tested only in short lesions. Second, we have, uh, they are not ideal for mid to distal tibules or below the ankle. Long-term durability is unknown. Stent fractures, we don't even have any idea what goes on there. The adverse impact on vasomotion, autoregulation, adaptive remodeling is all a possibility. From coronary data and severe calcium, when you look uh, at uh, severe uh, uh, you know, uh, deployment, you can see that the separation of struts become very significant, which actually is associated with higher restenosis. More stents, more cost, surgical option may become an op a problem, and restenosis can become a challenge to treat. There is also a lot of complexity when it comes to drug-eluting stent in the infrapopliteal stent design, complexity of disease, physical disruption of the vessel wall, vessel size, lesion length are all impact, you know, how the drug goes into the vessel wall. So a no-stent strategy f currently really makes a lot more sense as far as I'm concerned. We know from the Calcium 360 trial that orbital atherectomy and vessel prepping, you know, improved vessel compliance in uh, severe to moderate calcified disease below the knee. And that was associated with a reduced uh, major adverse events. We also have seen a reduction in TLR rate, but more important, less dissections and less bailout stenting in the Calcium 360 trial. We've seen in definitive LE with the infrapopliteal subgroup that the freedom from CD TLR was 91.2% and was better for clodicin compared to the limb ischemia, and patency was all the way up to 84%. Mind you, these are short lesions, and it came at a cost of distal embolization and flow-limiting dissections. The laser did the same. You know, PTA versus laser, uh, versus uh, uh, the laser had showed a three-year amputation-free survival and a freedom from TLR somewhat and a more advantage to the laser than just plain old balloon angioplasty. Again, if you look at nationwide U.S. databases from 2012, atherectomy was associated with a reduction in hospital mortality uh, and complications, but that did not pan out you know, in a recent meta-analysis just got published where mortality and, and amputation were, were, did not uh, show a difference there, and we just heard from Dr. Ansari's his data uh, you know, in that regard. So what's the importance also of atherectomy? You know, if you look at uh, some of the preclinical data, you know, these are cadaveric human lower limbs, Post-orbital atherectomy, there was a 400% increase in paclitaxel uptake in the tibial vessels. Most people do not realize that degree of increase in paclitaxel concentration post-orbital atherectomy, as well as a diffusion of the drug way far into the vessel wall. And the optimized below the knee trial is gonna tell us, you know, if that along with, uh, uh, play, along with the drug coated balloon is gonna make an impact on TLR as well as duplex ultrasound patency related. Again, this is not powered really for these endpoints, mostly powered for acute success, but we're gonna get some good signal from that study. Endovascular tacking may be a new uh, treatment on the horizon. You know, again, we have to remember that this is, um, uh, uh, you know, with, with the data presented by Dr. Broadman, there is some advantage to the precision of deployment. Seems to be very good, over 97.1% success rate. Uh, but again, we still have a ways to go with the patency rate down to 77.4%. So what's the ideal strategy? Leaving nothing behind, I would say debulk, motivate compliance enhance the biological response of drug-coated balloon, possibly by modifying calcium, and use limited stent or tack system for focal significant dissections. So to conclude, the infrapopliteal interventions, PTA carries poor outcome. Compared to PTA, and, uh, you know, we have a primary bare metal stenting seems to have similar outcomes. DCB, you know, does not add any advantage by itself. 
Drug eluding stent appear to be superior, at least in short lesion, proximal disease. However, the DES, as we have uh, shown, has a lot of limitation. Vessel prepping seems to make a lot more sense. Less bailout stenting and angiographic dissections, and overall acceptable freedom from TLR and patency at one year. Uh, all this hopefully will allow better drug absorption, penetration. So we are awaiting new trials like the optimized trial. Uh, again, think about focal stenting or tacking to treat localized disease uh, rather than carpet stenting in this type of vessels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me uh, introduce Dr. Soga, who came to us from Japan, and he also has contributed. Again, these guys are partners and have educated us. So he's going to talk about perforation and embolization uh, in, uh, for tibial uh, intervention. Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor to be here to present my presentation. Also, uh, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate uh, congratulations for great success. And today, I'd like to talk about this. Uh, before talking about the topic, uh, let me just share the, my complication, the, the population or this embolization. Uh, I was trying to uh, advanced guy the wire, but failed like this. Okay. Next one, the very heavily couch file lesion. Uh, the I advanced the guy the wire, CD guy the wire, but failed. The very heavily couch file. Uh, it's a it's a good milk mode, but failed. Uh, he, th this case is an 86-year-old female. Uh, target is here, uh, very tired of stenosis. The initially, uh, valangioplasty was performed like this, but the indentation uh, is remaining here. Uh, therefore, so I use the uh, cutting balloon. Cutting balloon. Uh, however, so you can see the hole like this. Uh, the uh, perforation was occurred. Even if you can use the uh, a true path, uh, so I advance the true perispirinal artery like this, uh, believing the sound guided. However, so uh, true path can make a hole and then make a every fistula like this. Uh, so as you can see, the um, wire perforation or uh, true pass perforation. How should we do managed? Uh, so I, I am thinking the option of the management of perforation, which we can do, is a very limited. So initially, uh, the inflow blockage of in inflow. Uh, so by using the balloon tamponade. The second, the, the manual compression or mechanical compression from the outer side uh, for fibers. 10 minutes, uh, the finally uh, it failed, so we, we may sh should consider the Kalembo addition. Okay, uh, let's uh, move on to the next topic, the digital embolization. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, to be honest, I have few distal embolization in TBL intervention. So we usually encounter the distal embolization during the iliac CDO or FMPOP CDO. Uh, therefore, so uh, I will show you the case. Uh, instant occlusion, uh, I uh, blend plasty was performed to cover the whole instant occlusion side. The result is pretty nice. Uh, however, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the prog uh, has been dropping like this. Then I use the aspiration catheter like this. And then we, we get uh, the plug like this. Uh, however, so to avoid the the avoidance of the this embola is also much important. I think uh, so initially, after the guide wire passage, uh, I used the jet stream for the 
they have a fresh lumbers of the uh, or a flesh plaque. Yeah, after that, the result is not so bad, uh, rather good. Uh, then uh, we can check the lumbers uh, from the <laughs> cover like this. Then uh, we can find the big flumbers like like a worm. Yeah. Great. So uh, the next, the, the, for the management of the emboli, so we usually use the plastic ground E1 during the procedure after occurrence of the uh, emboli, or so we are using the nitro proceed or a nitro injection to, to become a good runoff. Or sometimes, in some cases, we use the uh, anticoagulant drug, so uh, without the acute lean. So sometimes uh, we use the aspiration catheter or mechanical thrombectomy. But mechanical thrombectomy is not available in Japan yet. Uh, therefore, it's a very limited. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Soga. And uh, we have one more presentation, Dr. Lee, who was a fellow last year as part of the CVI, and this year uh, she became a faculty, uh, so uh, she's going to present a CVI fellow to faculty presentation. So hopefully she's going to give us some sense as to how do you grow from a fellow to a faculty. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. I've been a faculty for three weeks, so I think this is the perfect timing for this talk. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start with a uh, one case presentation. Uh, this was actually my very first case as an attending. 76-year-old man with uh, CAD had prior PCI and stage renal disease on dialysis, COPD, and obesity. He was found to have osteomyelitis of the right lower extremity, fifth digit, uh, and underwent amputation with one of our podiatrists. Um, he then subsequently obtained uh, ABI, which showed uh, 0.5 on the right lower extremity. Um, here are his angiograms when I took him to the lab. The patient actually did not remember that he had an iliac stent, but here is an iliac stent that was previously placed. You can appreciate the tortuosity of the common iliac as well as the internal iliac here. The stent here, as you can see, is a little bit undersized proximally, and it almost looks like it's a little bit wrangled, so um, that's an important uh, thing to point out here uh, because it will ultimately affect our uh, decision for how to treat. Um, the iliac itself is a little bit aneurysmal proximally, otherwise is relatively free of disease. There's a mild ISR within the stent itself. The common femoral is relatively free of disease, as is the SFA. Um, when we go below the knee, you can appreciate that the AT is completely occluded proximally. Um, distally, there is uh, reconstitution in the DP. So what would be your approach, um, given the uh, the uh, tortuosity of the iliacs as well as the undersized stent. Um, should it be contralateral access? Should I get anterograde access? Um, and then should I go uh, with retrograde up front or just try anterograde first, uh, dissection and reentry? Ultimately, um, I actually decided to go with an anterograde access um, just because of the uh, difficulty crossing that iliac. When I did put in um, a catheter past the stent, importantly, there was no notable gradient across the stent, so it did not require treatment. Um, so I also decided to um, uh, merge integrate and retrograde access um, techniques and then dissection and reentry. So here I have a glygold um, and from the integrate side um, and obtained a retrograde access into the DP, uh, placed the glygold uh, from a retrograde standpoint as well. Um, the two met in the uh, proximal AT, um, and then ultimately I was able to uh, feed the gold, uh, glygold into a antigrade CXI. I only saved a frame that it worked in, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I ballooned this uh, with a compliant 2.5 balloon, um, and you can see there's still significant residual stenosis. Um, so I further dilated using a chocolate 3.0, and this was the uh, completion result with intact flow to the AT. Uh, his ABI, uh, I don't have the uh, actual digital uh, ABI, but it improved from 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. I'm also trying to actually work with our vascular lab because as you know, a TBI is also very important in this. Um, so the institution I started at, uh, we were working on getting a TBI. Uh, so. 
so things to expect in your first month as an attending. Uh, start building a referral base, so meeting all the podiatrists in your area, uh, meeting your vascular surgeons as you know they are going to be great collaborators in your work, uh, knowing all of your wound specialists because you're, after you do your intervention, that's not where the care for the patient ends. It's the continuing wound uh, management of these patients. Knowing your cardiologist and your PCP is also very important as these uh, become a large referral base for you. And obviously be humble. You're the new guy or the new gal in town. Um, you're here to help and learn from your senior partners. Um, don't be, you know, uh, pompous or khaki. Uh, always be available. Make sure that your cell phone is readily available to everyone and make sure that you communicate with your referring uh, physicians. Um, in the last peripheral talk, we also discussed a little bit about billing, uh, and that's something that we never learn in medical school and very seldomly in training as well. So I encourage you, as you kind of go through your fellowship, understand more and more about uh, how to bill and, you know, exactly in peripheral procedures particularly because there's actually a lot to learn from that aspect. So also, more importantly, know your limitations, things to avoid in your first month as an attending would probably be wounds like this or like this. However, some things were unavoidable. This is my second case uh, <laughs> as an attending. Uh, this was a 75-year-old man with ischemic cardiomyopathy. He has known CTO of the RCA and circumflex with an EF of 15 uh, to 20%. He had a history of Guillain-Barre uh, had plasma in 2014 with essentially recovered function. He was actually living on his own. Um, he had been telling his family that he had had uh, sprained his Achilles uh, tendon uh, for the past four weeks. Um, and finally, the family noticed that his, his house was starting to smell a little bit, uh, and they brought him into the hospital. As it turns out, he has bilateral heel wounds as well as bilateral exposed Achilles tendons. Um, so his ABI, as you can see here, on the right was 0 0.31, and on the left was 0 0.36. Um, given the ABI findings, concern was uh, for bilateral SFA occlusion, and a bilateral AKA was offered by the vascular surgeon. When I first saw him, his right uh, Achilles tendon was still kind of white and pearly, still actually looked healthy despite the loss of soft tissue around it. His left Achilles tendon actually looked worse than this. Uh, it was completely black, and so was the heel. Um, so when I talked with my podiatrist, um, you know, the thought was maybe what we can do is try to save his right leg, given that it was still kind of, the tendon still looked healthy. Um, I, I actually had intended to bring him into the lab that same day. Uh, unfortunately, he has some anemia and some hypotension uh, necessitating blood transfusion. So his procedure was delayed for a couple of days as we kind of worked up the anemia. So by the time that I brought him to the lab, his right Achilles actually had already progressed. Um, what you can see here is that it's becoming black and uh, yellow uh, colored. So I took my initial angiogram uh, up and over. There's, as you can see here, common femoral disease that's calcified. The SFA is occluded. There's osteoprofunda disease. Um, completely occluded re re reconstitution below the knee in the P3 segment. There's an AT and essentially no flow actually to the posterior side of the leg at all. So um, I actually started initially with an anti approach uh, with a stiff angle glide wire um, and navy cross. That did not actually penetrate the proximal cap at all. Um, I attempted uh, retrograde access into the DP. However, there was a lesion in the DP which prohibited that. Um, so I ended up going retrograde in the proximal AT. Um, put, put, this is the um, micro, uh, micro uh, access wire, uh, which was then subsequently exchanged for a glide gold uh, with CXI support. I did have to modify a JR4 proximally to really engage the cap and advance a stiff angle glide wire. And ultimately, I was able to meet the two and externalize the retrograde wire. So I performed these. You said these you graduated two weeks ago? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I performed DCB of the CFA uh, and the SFA. Ended up placing a supera behind the knee because there was residual dissection and um, disease in the distal SFA and in the popliteal artery. Um, below the knee, um, I actually tried uh, to uh, go through the peroneal artery. It was really calcified. I couldn't push any equipment down at all. Um, and I actually tried to cross the pedal arch as well. I suspect he probably had an incomplete arch. Um, so these are my final pictures. So this is the common femoral SFA popliteal. The superiors are from here to here. Um, and the AT, and you can see the disease that was in the DP. 
So the goal in him, so he's not actually going to end up getting a left lower extremity, so the contralateral leg is going to get an AKA. And we're going to do watchful waiting on the right lower extremity. But depending on how the tissue responds now that the inflow is open, and there's actually a trickle of uh, flow through the peroneal now that I've poked it a bunch, um, he may ultimately still require a BKA, but at least he would have an AKA and BKA as opposed to bilateral AKAs. That's Thank great. you. Thank you so much. Stay here. <laughs> I just wanted to spend, uh, I give my chair to one of you guys, you can sit here. I just want to take 10, 15 minutes and, uh, you, know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of summarize, because this was a very, uh, wow, there's a lot of stuff we just went over. And, you know, see, hopefully we can summarize some kind of an algorithm, uh, you know, that we can use um, in these patients. So first, we started with access. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, let's see, uh, Dr. Mena. Uh, in regards to access, what is your algorithm as to when to go retrograde? You know, Art had to leave early, so we're going to pick on you. Uh, what is your algorithm in regards to going retrograde? Do you ever start right off the bat going retrograde, or do you always try anti-grade? And then if you do, how long? What's your algorithm? Yeah, so uh, I think that... Uh I would never start uh, retrograde first. I think that certainly we're showing you cases and films in which seems easy and relatively benign, but I don't think so. I would always start anti-grade. And uh, typically what I try to accomplish by doing so is to try to stay intraluminal. I'm talking specifically about below the knee interventions. And uh, if I'm able to do so within 10 minutes of fluoroscopy time, then I consider that a success. If I am unable to do that, then I will consider retrograde access. I think retrograde access, the problem is that, you know, you come to all these lectures and people talk and show these films, and the problem is that it's not necessarily as simple. There is a learning curve, number one. And number two, I'm always very thoughtful about what the surgical options are going to be and what is this retrograde access going to do to that. Because if in the process of doing this, I am completely, uh, you know, killing the surgical option, I also think that it's not necessarily smart. And if I am to do it, I would discuss it with my surgical colleagues and make sure that we're on the same page. I think that retrograde approaches and all these endovascular techniques are a complement to the vascular surgery approach. And only when you have that view, you can actually become right. successful at it. Right. Dr. Bakarak, you know, can you tell us, you know, you know, June presented, you know, she had very good training and, you know, pushing the envelope. Uh, what are your advice and your thoughts regarding building the relationship that Carlos is talking about? And, uh, you know, with these complex patients, I mean, when do you, when should you seek help when should you push the envelope so people don't say, oh, this, you know, people judge you too. If you are, your threshold is too low, then people say, oh, he's weak or she's weak. And, you know, I'd like to hear your advice. And you know, you've been in this field for a long time. Well, I, I mean, I don't have any pat answer. I think, you know, obviously I'm, I'm in a surgical group. So basically, I, you know, I, by, by default, um, they were the original people that were doing, um, and, you know, surgical revascularization. And I then complemented them with the endovascular approach at a time when endo was not very common. Um, you know, I think it's really a matter of planning. And so certainly what you want to do is if, you, if you're concerned about it or, you, or you, it's a very complex case or there is a significant amount of already existing tissue loss, that sort of thing, then it's often probably better to talk with your surgical colleague before you attempt something. And I think certainly it's much easier to to talk about the various potential complications and issues and what the bailout would be, rather than to get yourself into trouble and then suddenly call your surgical colleague and say, oh, listen, now I'm in trouble, or I've taken someone with a viable leg and it's no longer viable. So I think that's really, and so that concept of viability, and as Carlos just said, you know, what do you do to make certain that in fact, if it is a viable extremity, that you don't do anything, that your first job again is to do no harm. Um, so I think part of it's just a matter of communication. And, um, you know, the, the, I mean, it's really complementary skills. You recognize that, um, and again, depends a little bit on the surgeons that you're working with, some who are more endovascularly savvy, um, perhaps more contemporarily trained. Some of the older vascular surgeons really don't do as much or certainly are unwilling to take on some of the, especially the small vessel, especially tibial disease. And I think, you, you know, if you appropriately work with them. I think that, and again, recognizing um, access issues, um, you know, perhaps you send the, 
the case that has a high grade common femoral and profunda lesion, you send it for a common femoral endarterectomy, and then instead of trying to put a stent across the groin, which then potentially impacts on future access, may not have the same durability. So I mean, I think that you have to be cognizant yes. of what those surgical options are, and you, so you need to be able to talk to intelligently to your to your surgeon. So I think that's about the, yeah. the best advice I can no, give No, that's, that's awesome. I think the key, I mean, the most important part, I think, was that to discuss the case beforehand. The last thing you want to do on the table, having a complication, and then calling your surgeon saying that, oh, can you come? And then, you know, obviously they're busy, they're not going to be happy with you, and that's going to cause a problem. So June, in that case, in that second case you showed, how did you approach it? Like, I know you didn't just take the patient to the lab and work on that. Yeah, yeah. So what did you do? Um, hour-long conversations <laughs> with the podiatrist and the vascular surgeon beforehand, even the day of the procedure and then afterwards to lay out a, um, a careful plan for that patient just because we knew that he was at very high risk of limb loss regardless of how successful the revascularization was. Yeah. So that's great. I mean, I think that, you know, this is the kind of case when you're taking these complex cases, especially early on and you're going to take him on, is that make sure everybody's on the same page and that you have good discussion, you know. So, Jaffer, you know, you talked about, you know, angioplasty, and we know below the knee we are limited. We are, there are options, but it's still limited compared to the SFA. So uh, what is considered a decent time for angioplasty for below the knee? Is it two minutes? Somebody today was saying five to eight minutes. So what is the average duration of angioplasty? You leave the balloon for below the knee. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So as I mentioned during my talk, it's uh, for, uh, for it depends on what I'm doing. So if I've, I'm going to do standalone angioplasty with no DCB, which is what I would do below the knee, it would be two minutes. Two minutes. Um, and then I come down. If I'm doing SFA or popliteal and I'm going, and I know I'm going to follow that with a DCB, I'll usually do it 30 seconds, 45 seconds to see if I have a dissection. And then if I don't have a dissection, then I'll follow a DCB for three minutes. Yeah. And then that, so then that way I kind of know, because I'll know in 30 seconds if it's going right. to dissect that artery. So that's usually my algorithm. That, that's great. Uh, Dr. Soga, uh, I know that in Japan, a significant portion of the patients have end-stage renal disease. Yeah. Maybe 30, 40, sometimes 50%. Is yeah. that correct? So what do you do uh, dealing with calcification? You know, we had uh, Dr. Ansari kind of give us the American side of it, and Dr. Shamas, you know, there's a lot of atherectomy that's available here. I think there is less of these available in the Japan. So what do you guys do with these calcified tibial lesions in end-stage renal disease patients? Yeah, that, that's a big problem. So calcium density is very, very high. The vessel size is much smaller than the Western people. Uh, therefore, so it's not easy to manage the calcium uh, in especially dialysis patient. So actually, so we, we also have no option, just only blue angioplasty or some kind of uh, the penetration guide wire. We have no rotablator. We have no atherectomy device. Uh, that's a big problem. So just, just make an effort to fight the calcium. So how long do you do angioplasty in these tibial lesions? How long do you how? stay up? He said two minutes, Dr. Golzar. Yes, yeah, same, same. Maybe two minutes. Uh, it's it's my tolerance. Right. <laughs> 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 Dr. Ansari, what you wanted to say something? So let's give that to Kevin. Kevin, you know what do you? I know you talked about CTO crossing, but you know everything. So uh, so specialty balloon versus just a regular balloon. Is there an advantage and cost and all that? Um, well, it's certainly more expensive, um, and I don't think we have any really randomized trials to tell us for sure. Anecdotally, I feel like a specialty balloon gives me a more, more acute lumen gain than a normal balloon. I particularly like the night all cage balloons. And although it's expensive, I like to use a specialty balloon to get a, uh, a lot of acute lumen gain and then follow it with a drug-coated balloon um, for the biologic long-term effect. So Nick, you know, atherectomy, you know, is always, you know, we have a challenge with this uh, technology. So you, you did a nice job of kind of showing the shortcomings of all the various devices. And then you ended with atherectomy and basically highlighting, you know, debulking. But, you know, when we talk about tibials, 
And we talk about patients with one vessel runoff, right? These are not people with three vessel runoff and beautiful, you know, you know, foot pictures. You know, how much can you do? Like, how much debulking really can you do? Is it plaque modification? Is it debulking? What is it that we're really doing? And I know you have a lot of experience. Love to take, you know, get your input on that. Yeah, Mary, in the infrapopliteal world, you're really trying to do vessel compliance more than anything else. If, you, if you're ag very aggressive in debulking, you're going to trash literally the distal <clears throat> circulation, and you're going to end up with a lot of perfusion issues. You know, we, we can do that in the fem pop because we use a lot of filters, and we have right. bulky disease. You know, we tend to put filters in. You don't have that option, really, when you are, uh, you know, in the infrapopliteal segment. I, I, I'll modify that and say if you're a retrograde, you know, pedal access, and you're doing that type of orbital atherectomy, let's say, you know, a lot of the flow going back into your sheath, you know, with the, you know, you could technically flush back that distal embolization, yeah. you know, or flush it out. But if you're going, you know, uh, you know, anti-gradely and, and you're aggressively debulking, you know, we've seen issues of slow flow and problems. I, I would certainly avoid that and avoid that certainly in, in situation of wounds, you know, particularly patient with advanced disease, you know, where they are living off a very limited number, you know, of, of remaining vessels. And, and you can probably obliterate all that stuff if you're very aggressive. Very aggressive. So you recommend being much more judicial with atherectomy below the knee, obviously, for the reasons you mentioned. I, I would, and the, and the purpose is to do vessel compliance so I can get good uh, expansion of the vessel with whatever technology I'm using. Uh, and we've seen data, as I said, from the preclinical uh, world, you know, where you can get a lot of actually drug absorption. So we're hoping that this actually will help us, mm -hmm. you know, when we start adding some form of uh, drug-coated balloon downstream that we can get probably more effectiveness. Right now, if you put a DCB below the knee, you're not gonna get much effectiveness. I mean, we know that. The late lumen losses just haven't changed. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna leave the last question for Dr. Ida. You talked about innovation and uh, innovation in CLI. So, and you showed a little bit of data from the spinach uh, registry. So my question to you is that currently in your practice, uh, what percentage of the patients do you send for bypass? Uh, you know, is there a, you know, given the, the, you know, the algorithms that you have and the prediction models that you have created, what percentage in your practice do you think would be better off with, let's say, bypass and C that have CLI? So uh, this is a great point. I think in my practice, 5 to 10 percent. Yes. For the vascular surgery, uh, bypass therapy, because yes. the patient condition is very poor. Yes. The other is that about the 70 percent patient diabetes and the 50 percent patient is dialy on dialysis patients. Yes. Also, this patient has a poor cardiac function, the poor tolerance for the medication. So we decided to end first, but uh, I think the uh, wound with very severe infection, the large amount of the wound. Defined the result for the six is a good indication for the bypass surgery. So I big think. wounds where you big, need a yes, lot of blood wound, flow. And uh, also the wound infection. Infection. Wound yes. infection. Yeah. That's fantastic. Any questions from the audience? We have a couple more minutes. If anybody has a burning question they want to ask. Okay, well, fantastic. There is a reception on the 38th floor of the, the building across the street, right across, not the street, right across the, this building. And uh, it's called Crystal Peak. Uh, I think they have hors d'oeuvres and uh, some drinks. I don't think there is any marijuana. I apologize. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, you know, my my regrets. But uh, you know, what can we do next year? But uh, please join us and let's have a good time. Get to know each other. All Thank right. you very much. Thanks, no guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>